Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And of course, you can also promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and... Help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Happy Father's Day. I am posting this a day or so early because I'm in the middle of a crazy stretch of work travel. Uh, end of last week was San Francisco for a conference, plus a couple of podcasts with uh, Mark Ulrichson and Richard Kadri. Um, this week is Monday, Tuesday, FDA meetings, Wednesday, Thursday, client visit in Canada, then, then home. And things should settle after that, but you never know. Now, my old man is continuing to go through some rough health, which I've alluded to in recent months. Uh, and that's sort of the backdrop for my mood and, and frantic behavior all this time. Um, in fact, uh, about three minutes before stepping up to the podium on Thursday to, to moderate a 45-minute panel with five guests at a biotech conference, I um, I got a text saying my old man was headed to the ER after taking a fall when getting out of bed and cutting his head. Um, the plus side of being a burned-out, sleepless, cynical wreck of a human being is that it didn't phase me all that much. Uh, the panel went fine. I mean, yeah, I was concerned about my dad, but the person who said he was headed to the ER said, don't worry. And it turned out he just needed a staple to close the wound. But uh, happy Father's Day. On to less depressing stuff. My guest this week is Chris Reynolds, a cartoonist who has a new collection out now. It's called The New World, Comics from Mauritania. It's published by New York Review Comics. It, it collects work Chris did in the 80s and 90s. And the comics were published in the UK, and I totally missed them. So I'm glad New York Review Comics put together the new world, because they are unlike any comics I've ever read. And I've, I've read a lot. In our conversation, Chris gives the elevator pitch for his work as Strange Adventure Stories About Dreams which both captures and fails to capture it. Um, the comics themselves are black and white with heavy use of blacks, and they they tell stories of a kind of science fiction-inflected England. I mean, you know, you, you know certain things. An alien invasion has happened. Technology is rooted and forked in weird directions. Uh, a man invents a time machine. The dead may or may not stick around. All those elements and, and other genres kind of linger and pervade the stories, but they don't overwhelm the sheer dreaminess and, and the sense of loss that, that Chris's characters experience. The New World, it's a fantastic and strange and beautiful collection of, of long and short comics, and I'm, I'm awfully happy NYRC saw fit to publish them in this edition. 
Now, Chris and I got together at TCAF, the Toronto Comic Arts Festival, to, to record this episode. Earlier in the day, he did a panel with the great cartoonist, designer, and two-time podcast guest, Seth. Um, back in 2005, Seth wrote this really lovely appreciation of Chris's work, which I also missed, uh, but which apparently helped propel this collection into being. Um, a few of our exchanges refer to that panel, as well as the appreciation that Seth wrote way back, and I've put links to those in the show notes for the episode. Now here's Chris's deceptively simple bio. Chris Reynolds was born in Wales in 1960 and studied fine art at the North Staffordshire Polytechnic. He has worked as a filmmaker, publicist, and art teacher, but now devotes his time to drawing comics. He lives in Poole in the United Kingdom. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Chris Reynolds. Usually what I, I ask a guest about a, a, you know, a larger collection of their work, it's, it's a question of them revisiting their past work and what they see in it as they, they come to it. But in this case, I'm curious, what, what do you think a reader, what, what do you want the reader or how do you want the reader to, to read the new world? Is it the sort of thing that you think all of it in, in a, a single volume, like, or so much of it in a single volume is good or I think would you it's rather? Good. Yeah. I think it's good to have it all in, in a single volume collected together because, uh, it provides more of an overview, and people can read as much or as little of it as they want as they want at a sitting. Mm -hmm. And uh, all my early, well, all my work from this period is there, apart from a few other ones that uh, are hovering around, waiting to be put elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you do you want a reader to read it on mass? If someone said to you, "I read this all in a single sitting," would you say, "I'm so sorry," or "Wow, that was the perfect way to to read this"? I don't know. I think it, I, I I haven't really thought about whether that, whether people should read it at a single sitting or not, mm -hmm. because uh, for me, the important part of the book is the short stories in the middle. The 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 dials all right, the Mauritania graphic novels all right, but where I feel most at home is in the short in the short stories in the middle. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that I kind of did where I felt that I was getting closest to what I really had in mind, if I had anything in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, that question of intuition yeah. versus reason, which yeah. is part of the appreciation of the, this yeah. book, is, is something I also want to ask you about in terms yeah. of what was the writing process, I guess? The writing process has just been that I would come up with an idea for a story and I'd think, oh, that's quite a good idea. And I'd script it out or I script out what I had of it, it even if I didn't have any even if even if I didn't have all of it and I'd start drawing well I, I, I panelize it to get the script to fit into even nine panel mm. pages and then I start drawing and then I'd finish drawing and that would be a story and I'd think yeah this is all right or I'd think oh no I don't like that one or I'd change it or I'd add pages and more of that kind of thing in the early days of course because uh, as I grew, as I got more experience, I'd be more clued in onto what I was expecting of myself. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, I'd always try and do a new story rather than repeating the old story and kind of doing that again. And there's a certain kind of consistency of themes, I think, between my stories. But that isn't deliberate. That's just because they're all coming from me. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you characterize that that theme? Well, it's things I'm interested in. Yeah. I, 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 I put in my favourite things, not because they're my favourite things particularly, but be, because I feel I may as well write about what I like. And uh, why not stick those things in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you revisit those short stories in particular, um, do you see who you were in well, those moments? Yes, I do. And I'm pretty much the same person, mm -hmm. although... I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to do those stories now because my approach would probably be different and I'd be thinking certain other things should be highlighted more than the things that I highlighted then because in my more recent stuff that I've been doing I've cut down a lot on the descriptive panel yeah the exposition yeah uh, the, yeah and I have more people talking and because the characters in this are 
in the new world. They're kind of more like ciphers than kind of well-rounded characters. And I'm moving towards having characters that are more relatable, more conversations, and the story coming out from those conversations rather than from captions. What's changed for you in terms of storytelling that you want to move in that direction? Mainly, I think, because I've done those now. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do them again? The genesis for this book, I, I was asking a publisher, yeah. you know, how did you decide to, to publish The New World? What, and he said, really, it started with Seth writing this wonderful appreciation yes. in 2005, 2006. It was 2005 in Comics Journal, yes. Um, a, what was, beyond getting this book uh, together, what was the importance of that appreciation to you? And B, did it make you self-conscious about themes in your, your work that once they were pointed out by an outside party? Like well, that? yes, because... Previously, I'd just done stories and thought there's themes in here, there's certain things going on, but I'd not actually had it pointed out by somebody else and pointed out so insightfully mm -hmm. what I'd been doing. Yeah. And uh, it made me panic a bit, yes, because I thought, <laughs> oh, what's happening? Somebody knows my work better than I do. I don't understand. But uh, that, it was fine, and I, I just carried on. And uh, I did think to myself, should I stop doing this kind of story and start doing other kind of stories, or should I carry on? Because at the end of Seth's appreciation, he said that the Mauritania graphic novel seemed to draw the Mauritania world to a close. And I was thinking, hmm, should I draw it to a close? No, not really. So I've, got, I've carried on doing Mauritania type, sto type stories. But I've also started doing other stories, like I've, I've done some superhero stories. And I've done some cinema detective stories. And it's from this thing about not wanting to repeat myself too much anyway and wanting to try new things. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little about the um, the various sort of genre influences in your work? Uh, when you were talking with Seth earlier, he yeah. asked whether you cared particularly about science fiction or whether it was more of a device, but that, the detective stories, et cetera. Well, they're, they're things that I like. Mm -hmm. um, because with the, with the detective stories, I like kind of bad old detective books I, I like the kind of atmosphere of them, mm -hmm. kind of not particularly well-written stories from the 1950s that they put out because they were about detectives. And I kind of like the feel of those. And with my cinema, cinema detective stories, particularly the ones I've been doing more recently, I've been wanting to kind of capture that kind of feel. And I've not been particularly successful in that, I don't think, because uh, I've not tried... I'm not, I'm not doing a pastiche of them or anything like that. I'm trying to kind of redo them in my own way. Um, and I've lost the track of the question that you're asking. <laughs> oh, just the, the, the influence of, of those specific genres and, you know, what they bring to you and what you're, you're you know, reflecting, how you reflect them well, in your work. Science fiction, I like Philip K. Dick. I like Cord Werner Smith. I like Isaac Asimov. Um, I like, from Asimov, probably the foundation story best of all because all that stuff about harry selden getting it wrong yeah and uh the humans only galaxy and that kind of thing you, you've heard that the trump is actually the mule theory right <laughs> i've not heard that one no. oh yeah yeah that it was just <laughs> yeah. uh, back during the, the yeah. primaries yeah. It, it came up and i thought well that captures it perfectly yeah. he, he completely breaks the the curves yeah. and normality yeah. and yeah. sees yeah. inside yeah. people and makes horrible insights about them and yeah. boom yeah um Unfortunately, we now have to live with that for the, yeah. the next couple of years. But <laughs> but still. And I like Cord Wenner Smith, of course, because it's so mad and uh, so far in the future. And uh, with the Philip K. Dick, it's got all that stuff about kind of the everyday side to science fiction, like doors that answer back and German television sets that are spies and that kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And detective fiction and crime fiction also. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Dick Francis at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, British science, British uh, detective but it hasn't really made any influence on me yet because i've been reading them too recently you know it's just something i started reading recently another chap i like frederick brown very good detective writer from the 1940s i think and uh he wrote about chicago and i think some of that is perhaps an influence in these stories hmm. yeah. and again i guess that gets at the question of not wanting to look too deeply 
at those things for fear of overanalyzing and kind of well kind of... I, I only ever bought two frederick Gra Fr frederick okay. <laughs> brown books i'm i'm because there aren't that many of them and i'm i'm, mm. I'm, I'm thinking i'll kind of gradually buy them slowly mm. yeah who were the the writing influences themselves for you uh i don't think you they know, were were there uh... stylistic influences or anything or influences in terms of what the story was about it was just kind of a kind of feel of those things because mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be capable of writing the foundation because I wouldn't have the interest to carry the story on it with all that detail. I wouldn't have the interest in writing a Philip K. Dick story because I don't kind of have the same concerns really. And the Cordwainer Smith, I'd quite like to do, to kind of do something in the Cordwainer Smith mold in that kind of far, far future sort of way. So I mean, perhaps I'll try that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you've written some prose novels yeah. Also, do you, do those have certain? Um... I I did it as I was saying to Seth this morning yeah. because I was looking for an easier way of telling stories. Yeah. But it turned out to be a more difficult way of to telling stories because I, I I had great difficulty with the description and with the uh, with my sentence length because I used the sm short sentences like in uh, the comics, and I don't think that my comics voice is particularly well suited to telling a prose novel and well it was an interesting experiment mm -hmm. yeah and you've seen some of the prose work filter back into comics or have you adapted some of the stuff you tried doing in prose back well, into in this book the first cinema detective story where rosa goes to america started out as a prose story mm -hmm. because i wrote that many many years ago perhaps about five years before i started doing comics and then i adapted it into the story that's in there mm-hmm one of the other themes that came up during that conversation <laughs> was nostalgia and its its role in your your work. To me, it looks like nostalgia for the time from before you were born. And yeah, that's a good insight. Yeah, I would say that's true. Yeah, I once had this idea that you'd go around and look at things, and anything that was already in the world when you were born was okay, but anything that was invented or came up after you were born. <laughs> You know, you weren't quite sure because it's not from you, you know. <laughs> yeah. And how do you deal, I mean, given the rapid, rapid change and state we live in now? You know, how well, much of that is... is real yeah. life pushes you around a lot, I've found. Yeah. And so you can't really get away from it. And you might as well, might as well accept what you can. <laughs> and so I've, I've, I've moved away from what I was saying just now. And I'm thinking that uh, there's not much, leave, not much mileage in thinking that way. But in terms of the style of the drawing and the kind of the physical reality of what's in the stories. It probably does have a strong, a strong reality of being from then. Yeah. From, and it seems post-war, <coughs> sorry, post-war, but you come from a little bit after the post-war era. You're born around 60 or 61? Born in 1960. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're not quite there for reconstruction after World War II and, no. and rationing, but... But in the kind of the kind of period of what was stability in those days, it was kind of in that period because I, when I drew those, wrote and drew those stories, I kind of had the idea that these will take place in a world that's in a bit of a steady state, and you know things are going to happen, but there's going to be this steady state going on, and there's not going to be any particularly dramatic things happening. I mean, dramatic things do happen, but there's going to be no kind of big sweeping changes it's going to be this continuum of many years of things being pretty much the same but things happen to the characters and i thought perhaps perhaps something to do with security about that not sure but i didn't want to kind of perhaps i had the idea that i wanted to have a, a kind of solidity of place and having a long period of peace and comparatively sameness would make it seem less fleeting. Mm. Everything does seem to have occurred before in the the story, even the the, the dial, the the lead novella. Yes, in it. it all happened before. Now we're looking back on it. Yeah, we're dealing yeah. with the aftermath. Yeah. We're looking back at the things from before we were around. That's got some. Perhaps it's something to do with storytelling because um, my wife took me to see some Greek drama. And we saw this thing and the bloke's talking on the stage and it was a bit dull. 
and uh, but they were talking about a battle, and they said, it's going to be this great big battle tomorrow. And I was thinking, oh, it's going to liven up, we're going to see this fantastic battle. So I said, well, it's, been, it's, been, it's been worth the wait. <laughs> it went on to the next scene, same two blokes came on. Did you see that battle yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps it's something like that, you know, and uh, yeah. You'd rather have the the reflection after the yeah, fact instead be, of the, the... Because I'm not really interested in, as it were, the battle itself. I'd much rather kind of have the atmosphere or the thinking about it, something like that, I think. But my answer that I'm giving now, I'm not, I'm not sure about it. Oh, that's yeah. fine. I, I assume anything you tell me is just what we're saying in the moment. Yeah. That's, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say this is the gospel yeah. of what Chris is all about. So... Um, but that said, let's go deeply psychoanalytical. I'm just kidding. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I did want to ask. I was I was interested again during that that panel. You'd mentioned uh, your father was a classics teacher yeah. uh, and your mother was a, an art teacher. Yes. Um, do you see uh, obviously the art thing? Um, but do you see both of those th either of those threads in, yeah, in your yeah. work? Particularly? I didn't particularly at the time, but I, I see them now for sure. Yeah, and they're both very interested in archaeology and nature and that kind of thing and so i was surrounded by that stuff where i grew up and it just went in there you know yeah mm -hmm. so for sure yeah and your folks were supportive of, of comics they've always been supportive of comics mm -hmm. they they buy me comics my grandparents would buy me comics my dad would meet would read my comics after i'd read them and that mm -hmm. kind of thing and moving i think you, you went to art school were working trying to work in in figurative painting figurative painting once yeah. upon a time yeah. and then comics became the the mode for you they did yeah but i all the time i was doing my figurative painting as well i've been writing i've been writing short stories mm. that were pretty much about the same kind of thing as the mauritania comics became later so the the, the, the kind of two two strands kind of automatically merged it seems looking back on it did you know what a cartoonist was what it meant to be a cartoonist i suppose well there are many were... different cartoonists because yeah. When I was at school, I used to sit next to a chap called Malcolm Humphreys, mm -hmm. and he always wanted to be a cartoonist. And he became a cartoonist, and he was he, he worked on the Western Mail in, in Wales and did political cartoons and did all sorts, and he's still doing it. Um, but we were talking recently, and uh, we do completely different kinds of cartoons. He does cartoons about Welsh rugby, caricature that kind of thing and i do things like this like kind of long longish introspective narrative stories and we came across recently a strip we'd done well it was actually a board game that we did together while we yeah. were at school <laughs> and, and oh yeah fantastic look, look at this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah do you stay in touch with with other artists or other people from your 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 youth not really no i mean f facebook brought me back in touch with a lot of people but i've i've kind of gone off facebook because uh i it seems to me on on facebook it kind of comes up behind you it gets closer and closer and it just says is this your brother is this is you know, oh yeah did, did you yeah. know this person i'm thinking well yeah but i don't particularly want facebook to be coming up with, you know, <laughs> okay you don't need yeah, to draw the yeah, connections yeah, in my yeah, life yeah, I, yeah, I, I do that yeah, myself yeah yeah. yeah 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 literally all i use yeah. it for it's been a year and a half that now all i do is promote the show i don't yeah. post anything about my life yeah. i don't uh you know comment on other yeah. people's stuff yeah. i just use it to, to well i've come off it completely i mean I haven't kind of deleted my profile or anything, but I just don't go on there anymore. Yeah. 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 I think it's, it's healthier. Yeah. But I'm on Twitter. Yeah. Which and is it, more fun. And if anybody wants to know, it's Mauritania comic is the handle, but without, but not comics, it's just comic because otherwise the name would be too long. Ah, okay. <laughs> and you're also cinema detective as your, your handle, I think, or, or something um, like that. Cause that's how it first showed us. Cinema detective yeah. is following you. It said on, yeah, on Twitter, yeah, I'm like, yeah. who is it? Oh, oh, yeah, okay. That's, yeah. that's Mauritania guy. Yeah. <laughs> Where did Cinema Detective come from? Well, that's like we were talking before. It came from um, it came from me liking cheap nineteen fifties British crime books mm -hmm. that were done not particularly well, but had a lot of charm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the idea is that Ken and Rosa they live in Birmingham, UK, and uh, they make films about their old cases, and. So they're a normal detective agency, in a, and they make films about the cases, and so they're colloquially known locally as the cinema detectives. Gotcha. And it's like kind of Paul Temple, you know, he's a crime writer who 
goes around solving crimes as well mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And I thought, yeah, I could, I, I could do some stories about that. And uh, so I, I occasionally do one. Yeah. And sort of, at least in here, sort of bring them into the... And, I they, mean, and they, they, they cross over with... The, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's yeah, uh, I hate yeah. to do the, the shared universe yeah. canonical thing, especially when so many of the stories are well, so self-contained. But but all my stories are in the shared universe. Even the superhero ones are in there. You know, mm -hmm. The Moon Queen and the Bee that I've, I've done recently. It was that a influence that whole like the, the marvel universe type thing when you were yeah, uh, was, a kid yeah, yeah but in this period when i did these stories in the new world it it wasn't really in any of the in any of my stories to to have superheroes oh i just mean the whole shared yeah. continuum thing you know having the the different threads well I've never really kind of thought to myself, oh, there's a world of Mauritania. I just thought, I'll do a story about this. I'll do a story about that. And a few years ago, I thought, right, there's three main strands of the world of the work. There's Mauritania stuff, there's Cinema Detectives, and there's Moon Queen and the Bee. So I'll kind of split them up and have the three. But that's just an artificial way of separating them. And I don't know how, I thought it might be useful. And now I don't think it's particularly useful. And a story is just a story. What did you learn about story? What did you get better at in terms of how to tell a story? Uh, I'm getting better at, as we were saying, moving across. Because the use of captions in this, in the New World and these previous stories, I think it's quite strong. It's, it's quite a good way of telling those particular stories. But I've been moving on, as I was saying, to having the story told more through dialogue. Not so much through action, because I'm not really interested in action, as we discussed previously but certainly more in terms of developing the story through dialogue hmm. because it's not, there's nothing wrong with a new world way of telling the story, but this is just different and it's fun to try something new. Mm -hmm. And you, you, well, you mentioned with cinema detectives, um, you know, they're making movies about their cases. Yeah. You also worked, you, you did uh, some films yes. and, and tried to, to at least experiment with, with movie making. I've, I've, I've done as I said in, in the, the interview, Seth, I've, I've done commercial videos. I've also, I did a Mauritania comics film, which is on YouTube, called Hunters of the Sun. But uh, it's not been, it's been like my paintings. I've not really had the interest to kind of really get get into it and, 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 and push it. And I found, particularly while making Hunters of the, uh, Hunters of the Sun, that there's very little creativity. All you're doing is organising things. It's an exercise in losing all your money and lo and in logistics. And and and, and yeah. uh, you think, well, I was going to make this film, but I'm doing all this other stuff, you know. And I could just sit down and, and draw a comic of it. It'd be, it'd be miles <laughs> easier because I got. Into, I started doing that film because I'd always wanted to do a film. And I thought sneakily at the back back of my mind, it might be easier than doing comics. Ah, because <laughs> <laughs> we know cartoonists hide by themselves. They they you know yeah. hunched over a drawing board. Yeah. That's. It, was there anything you learned about either storytelling or visual presentation from the film stuff that that leaked back into comics for you? Uh, or are they really distinct in terms of? Uh, I don't think it fed back in any useful way that I know about so far. Anyway, yeah. I know uh, when I recorded with R.O. Blackman uh, a couple of, about a year or so ago, uh, his mindset is that comics are essentially storyboards for, for film and animation. And it, I think it's yeah. a very conservative and weird approach. Yeah. Um, did you see it that way or did that uh, I've approach? never thought that. I've, yeah. I've, I've all, and particularly now, I think comics are by far the superior art form for what I'm trying to do anyway. Mm -hmm. Because... You don't need to call in favours from your friends. You don't need to lose all your money. You don't need to worry about film stock. I mean, you do it on video these days. You don't need to worry about cameras, insurance, uh, editing, music. I mean, music in films, the people in the films don't hear it. How does that work? You know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and as we've discussed, text novels, prose novels, you've got to put all that description in. You've got to work out where to put your exposition Whereas, whereas with a comic, you can just be as weird as you like and you've got a series of pictures holding the reader to this kind of central thread and you can do what you like. Mm -hmm. You've written theatre at all? 
No, I've not. Oh, Actually, yes, I've done a Cinema Detectives play, and mm-hmm. you can download it from my website, cinemadetectives.com. What was that experience? Was that a... Because I'm wondering if that's sort of the middle ground between film and comics in terms of... of no, I just did it once. I thought, I'll try a play. I thought I'll do four characters, or th- possibly even three, a small play that people can put on about the Cinema Detectives. And so I... I it's quite old now. I did it about five years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah. nothing that, again, turned into the, oh, well, I'm interested in doing this stuff, or was no. it a creative dead end uh, along those lines? Well, creative dead end sounds like it was a bit of a dead end. but uh, An exercise. Uh, it it was an exercise. I didn't know where it was going. And like like before, trying something new. Not knowing where it's going sounds like your, your motif, I guess, in well, terms of, of that, the sense yeah, of intuitiveness. I, 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 I do like to try new things and things that I've not done before, even if they end up being pretty much the same as what I've done before. At least it's starting out from somewhere else. Perhaps it's like kind of clock golf where you knock it from all different angles to the same <laughs> hole you know, without me realizing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little about intuition, which I know is defeating the purpose of intuition, uh, but the role it plays well, artistically for you? Yeah. Uh, when I'm coming up with a story, I don't like to kind of spend too long thinking about it. Like I don't use a thesaurus or anything like that. If I'm having difficulty with a name, I think, right, I'll think up a name in the next few seconds and I'm going to go with it. And normally those names are pretty, they fit quite well. And that might not be because I thought a particularly good name. It might be because once I've thought up the name, I've got to deal with it. And so that brings things up in Mm. itself. Uh, Otherwise, the other kind of intuitive area is probably when I've storyboarded something and I've lettered it is what I'm actually going to put in the panels because in at this time I didn't work out what the drawings were actually going to be until I'd pretty well got the script sorted and then the drawings had to come up to fill those panels to support the story. The drawings came last in those uh, mm. in, in those stories. And that's changed for you? Well, more recently, more recently, when I've been doing computers, well, sorry, stories on computer recently, I've been doing more stories where I, I just start out, I, I do a panel and, and get a conversation going because I'm doing more, more of these conversations now. And then the thing develops and it gets to about 20, 25 panels. And I think, right now I'm going to reel it back in. So I script the rest of it to kind of bring the story to a conclusion and then create the kind of last panels and that's a kind of different way of working to pre-planning everything but it's more fun in a way because it's it's like more of a a surprise to me when i find out what what the story is going to do yeah and do you get that sense of surprise you know is that still a yes i do sometimes but having done it so often i'm thinking that now i could do yet another new approach Mm -hmm. but i don't know what what that's going to be yet because i've even been thinking shall i get out the old paper again and start drawing some stories in the old way i mean i don't think that my hands could handle it because i'm i've been having difficulty holding the pen steady enough to do the lettering for years you know mm. but but yeah you could still print the lettering afterwards I while, could. while drawing I, everything yeah, else yeah. i could but i the way of that i'm doing the comics now by having pre-prepared yeah, artwork true. layers in photoshop is so convenient that I'm thinking I, I, I probably won't be going back from that. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. the, the difference between paper yeah. and digital for yeah. you. It really it's, is. It's, a... it's uh, Doing it digitally is a good way of doing it because you mm-hmm. can change the perspective, you can change the proportions, and you can mess with it to your heart's content. And uh, anything new needs drawing, you just draw it up. and You've, you've got it in the catalogue forever. You can always re- reuse it. And uh, it's and the results might not be quite as appreciated by the audience, but they're certainly appreciated by me because I don't have to do all that drawing. Yeah. I didn't mind doing the drawing, but it was uh, I was finding it a bit constricting having just having to draw everything. Mm-hmm. Which and it came up during your conversation with Seth, you know, creates that tension of cartoonists who just wish they didn't have to draw stuff. Yeah, you know, but you also don't want to just write for somebody else to draw. No, you don't. Well, I don't because yeah. I want to have it exactly the way I want it. Yeah. And 
some cartoonists, because we were talking about the American Splendor cartoonists, I like the kind of very straightforward drawing style. Uh, I, 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 I don't like, well, for, for, for anything that I write, I don't particularly like it anybody illustrating it that has a kind of distinctive style mm -hmm. because I was thinking if I wanted it drawn like that, I'd draw it myself differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I, I was recording with David Lloyd last week. Yeah. Uh, He's visiting uh, in yeah. New York and he'd mentioned something about how Dave Gibbons was trained as a surveyor. And I was like, yeah. Oh, Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> you know, just cause that, yeah. that geometric you know yes plainness yeah. i don't mean it in a bad way but just yeah. his way of, of framing yeah. everything yeah you know i, I could see yeah. those eyes suddenly yeah. it made sense uh, yeah so, you know um but you're you're fine with digital and happy did it take you a while to get comfortable drawing on a tablet or no, i don't draw on tablet i i draw on paper but then scan oh okay yeah. i wasn't sure if you yeah. do the, the yeah. okay so it's still yeah one step removed but. yeah but, i mean I've, 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 I've tried drawing with a tablet but i don't like it yeah yeah you know, um, that's a lot of artists. Yeah. <laughs> expert. They say nowadays it, it's getting better at replicating the, the texture and, and the, the force. But the other thing is, I, but... I do like to still, I, I, I do like to be away from the computer. Sometimes I just go and sit on the chair with the pad on my knee and, and, mm. and, and do the drawing and think, right, scan it. And, yeah. You also like getting away in general in terms of long walks. I do. Yeah. And getting yeah. out yeah. of, yeah. out of, yeah. you know. Yeah. the home environment i i do like to walk around and 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 to wander and that kind of thing yeah. do um do ideas either occur to you or straighten themselves out when you get away like that not really i, I it's just for the sake of I, walking i think that if i'm thinking about anything while i'm walking i i tend to fret rather than come yeah. up with ideas <laughs> yeah that's, that's what i wonder i i'm just a giant ball of anxiety so yeah. so i, I wonder yeah. about that yeah. sort of stuff sometimes just the getting away from everything and not thinking about it is where it suddenly solves yeah. itself and yeah. you can oh yeah. that's what i should be doing when well, i get back in my day job as i was saying before i'm a care worker mm -hmm. and when i'm with my clients i find that very very kind of calming because you're thinking about their things and that's that's wonderful you know do you um do you steal story ideas from them i don't steal story ideas from them but i do find them inspiring okay i find the clients inspiring and reassuring too yeah how so well because like you were just saying oh i'm a huge ball of anxiety well i'm a huge ball of anxiety as well but when you 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 with a client looking after them and doing things for them and reassuring them you're reassuring yourself as well you know you say oh you don't have to worry about this and you're thinking i could have do i could have done with telling myself that <laughs> <laughs> there are a project or a story that you're you want to get to i don't know because when I came, before I came to Toronto, John Park, in particular, my, my, my friend who put on the launch party in Worthing, was saying, Chris, come up with some ideas about what you want to do. And when you go to Toronto, suggest them to people and see if anything come, kind of come, can, can come of them. But I've not been able to think of anything. I've just come here <laughs> and, and thought, I'm going to do these interviews and do my best at the interviews. But I really can't think what of, of, of any big project that I want to suggest to anybody. I mean, if anybody was to come to me and say, Chris... Can you do this and can you get involved in this project? I'd certainly look at it very seriously yeah. and, and, and be very interested in, 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 in doing anything. Mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, I'd wondered if there was yeah. just one either adaptation or, or something else you'd been thinking. <laughs> well, we were <laughs> you know talking before, yeah. we were talking before about Cordwain and Smith yeah. and I was thinking perhaps I could do something along those lines. You know, perhaps I could do something set in the far, far future, which would, would kind of have that thing where it's kind of so way out it kind of makes your head swim yeah something like that sort of 1 million ad yeah, yeah. you know just just because i was i i recommended the cordwain and smith stories to one of my friends and I, he he said well why do you like these and i said it reminds me of being a very small child and it does because when you're a very small child there are so many things going on. You don't know what they are. And it's the same because 
or in, in the Cord Wenner Smith story stories, you don't know what these things are, and then they kind of swim around you. you know? And I, I think you'd said also this morning on the panel that unlike virtually every other cartoonist, you're not tormented by your childhood particularly, right? No, I'm not tormented by my childhood at all. Yeah, that's weird. I don't I'm, think you're going to fit in here. At, at, I'm at, tormented <laughs> by the passage of time and and how to kind of how to kind of make sense of the passing of people and the passing of situations and the pass passing of stages in your life. Yeah, in terms of mortality or just change overall? In terms of in terms of change. I mean, mortality we all know it's gonna yeah, happen. The big change. And it don't matter because yeah. if you could live forever, would you bother doing anything? Mm. And other similar, not particularly important questions in my view, but the the the, the kind of changes over the years you know, you 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 realise I'm not I'm never going to go there again and dam that stream again or build a treehouse in that tree again. But it was great when it happened. Mm -hmm. You sort of seem to capture that in a number of stories in in the New World, but particularly the one about the man in the time machine. Yeah, with that that absolutely either devastating or, or absolutely wonderful final panel where we realize what the time machine is. Yeah. Um, and that didn't help you get over it, I assume. Uh, there was no cathartic effect of actually managing I'm, to encapsulate that perfectly. <laughs> I'm not really, interested, not really interested in a cathartic effect. I'm more interested in, in writing something about it. Yeah. You know, to, to, to kind of... to get something from it. Mm -hmm. to make it something that's actually going to help you know blimming time might be passing but at least i've got a story out of it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you've made a wonderful body of work over the the years did you um how did you feel when you saw the the collected edition i thought it was wonderful yeah. first of all i saw a picture of it before i'd actually seen the book mm -hmm. and it was posted by lucas and gill sorry lucas and um nick gabe oh okay. yeah okay. at yeah. uh at their New York New York offices, and I thought, ah, oh, it looks fantastic, you know. And then I, I I I got a copy, and it still looks fantastic, yeah. <laughs> and it still and it still does. And at the at the launch party um, in Worthing, my friend Shez was the photographer there from Smoke and Mirrors Photography, and she took a number of pictures there of the book and of me and signings and things. And it looks fantastic in her pictures as well. And the the way that the light reflects on the on the metallic cover is. Uh, it's marvelous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, had you um, had you ever visualized what it would look like altogether, or was this something that you know? I, I yeah. well, before I actually saw the book or a picture of a book, there was an image circulating of the cover mm. in kind of flat colors. So I'd seen that, and I didn't know it was going to be. I didn't even know it's going to be hardback to uh, to start with. Yeah. I didn't know it's going to be m m metallic until quite late on. Uh, didn't know it was going to be embossed until I saw it on their description. I thought, oh, embossed, I wonder what that means. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, debossed even. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I d certainly didn't know it was going to be so huge, you know, so 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 thick. I thought it would be about half the thickness and, 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 and paperback. But so when it comes out like this, I just think marvellous. But on the other hand, all the stuff being in there, in some ways it's not mine anymore. And if it is mine, it's from a different me. Yeah, and that's sort of what I was yeah. I was getting at earlier. Yeah. I was wondering, do you see these past selves when you're looking at it, or or is it out in the world now in a way that is out of your hands? Well, it's it's it. Like I was saying, I think I was saying to Seth, I drew a line under those stories and started doing the computer stories, which were, I I thought the computer stories could be more more mutable. I could change them if I wanted. I could. I was going to have it a lot looser now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, I'll draw the line under those old ones. They're all set. They're finished. And they can be I, they can be finished with, published or not published. or yeah. and But the new ones are going to be more fluid, going to try lots of new different things. But now that these stories, these new world stories are in there and they're in this book, it does feel that they've gone away. They've, yeah. you know, it's a lovely book. And Seth has done a fantastic job. And I'm very, 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 very pleased with it. <laughs> but they have gone away now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I guess that sense of externalizing, like this yeah. were a, mo a monument of your life at that time. And I'm not sure I like a monument of my life either. Sorry. But, I, but <laughs> I'd rather have it than not have it, you understand. Yeah. You know, far rather. Yeah, yeah. Were you tempted at all to, to fix anything? No, because when this project first came up, I thought to myself, I'm not going to try and influence this book in any way. I'm going to let them do exactly what they want, and I'm going to just agree to everything, because these stories are all finished. Yeah. And so... I've not objected to anything. I've not made any any suggestions. I don't think I've made any uh, any suggestions anyway. Just let them get on with it, trust them, and then they did a marvelous job. Okay. Yeah. That's I wonder. Some artists, yeah. Yeah. especially because especially for cartoonists, your development is in front of everybody. It's, it's completely visible. Yeah. So some cartoonists look back at early work and yeah, if I could just change that arm, uh, let yeah. me get this panel back to you. And, and yeah. but you were comfortable enough with. I don't want to. Yeah, there are so many stories and so many little things. About, uh, but I've I've tried changing panels in various things. Well, I've I've occasionally changed things, but I've always thought, has it lost something by my changing that? And the answer is probably yes. Mm -hmm. And so even if I've technically improved it, it's kind of it's not the unity that it, it isn't the have. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess it all, uh, once again, sort of ties into that um, that notion of intuition that you, you were talking about and that comes yeah. up in the, the book, yeah. uh, that, that sense of not being sure where things are going, but that the... Well, it, it, it keeps me interested in it. You know? Yeah. If, if, I, if I knew all that was going to happen, I wouldn't bother. Mm -hmm. I think you talk a little about um, what it was like cartooning in that mid 80s to late 80s London escape, well, Paul Gravette nexus of, of. Some of it was done by candlelight. Yeah. Because when I was doing Monitor's Human Reward, I lived in a house where everybody else was very poor at paying the electricity bill. <laughs> and so I remember doing some of Monitor's Human Reward by candlelight. Uh, otherwise, I'd have a board, I'd draw on my knee, I'd use. I used to use washable ink for some reason, which I don't remember because I don't know, perhaps it was, I thought I'd save my brushes, but now I'd use the kind of solid ink that wouldn't wash away. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd draw the, you know, for doing the artwork, I'd draw the panel lines first, ink the panel lines, draw horizontal bars in pencil for the lettering, do the lettering. Then I'd do the wiggly lines around the lettering using a comb that I cut very carefully yeah. to create that. Then I'd pencil in very roughly the compositions of the panels, and then one by one I'd work up the panels going through the story. And then I'd tidy up, erase, process white, and uh, and then I'd decide whether I like the story or not. Mm -hmm. Finally, usually I would, but there's some stories I haven't worked out, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a sense of that interaction with the other cartoonists? Was there a, a any sort of pushing or, yeah, holy crap, this guy's working at this level, I better raise my game? Or Not did really, you feel no, you were no. really working in your own vein? I was working on my own vein because nobody was doing quite the same kind of thing. Yeah. And I, 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 think, there's, I think that they're still not. I... I, I, I you know, there's a lot more stuff and introspective stuff and stuff about dreams out there now, but I'm still kind of the only one in what in kind of my area, I think, doing doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's still a tough thing for me <laughs> how to describe or characterize your kind of thing. I'm, well, I'm, yeah, I've I've been trying for years and years to kind of do what they call the lift conversation. Yeah, though. the elevator pitch. We, yeah, we call the it, elevator yeah. pitch, <laughs> and I've never come up with it. I, f I forced myself, and what was it? I thought that they're strange adventure stories about dreams. I thought up. I thought, will that cover it? Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty good, pretty good description. Now that we've, we've got, I'll go back and put that in the introduction about all this stuff. Um, the sense of having a cult following. You know, did, did you know that you had an audience out there? For this work back in the 80s and then through the, the the decades well it seems to me that the way it's been some people really 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 like it yeah 
most people are completely indifferent. Some people, if you put it in front of them, will say, oh, yeah, quite nice. But there's some people who really, really like it. And uh, it's it's nice that they're there. You know. Understood. Yeah. We'll try and find more of them. Yeah. I'll, I'm hoping I'll voice this <laughs> yeah. book off on a, yeah. a lot of people. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gil. And that was Chris Reynolds. The New World, Comics from Mauritania, is available in bookstores and comic shops all over. It's published by New York Review Comics, or NYRC. Uh, Chris is online and publishing new work at cinemadetectives.com. And both cinema and detectives are spelled the usual way, not like some dope coming up with chimeraobscura.com for his website. Uh, Chris is also on Twitter um, with a much more difficult handle of Mauritania Comic, which is spelled M-A-U-R-E-T-A-N-I-A-C-O-M-I-C. But you can also find that account just by searching for Cinema Detectives on Twitter. Like I said, The New World is a fantastic and strange and beautiful collection, and I'm awfully glad that NYRC put it together and that they were able to connect me and Chris during TCAF. If you're an art comics reader, you really ought to pick it up. And after we wrapped, I asked Chris, so, who are you reading? That was a strange answer, as you can imagine, from the, uh, the conversation we just had. And if you want to hear it, you're going to need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet. The newest episode of that one features 40 minutes of new material from Dave McKean, Paul Karasik, Mark Newgarden, Seymour Quast, John Leland, Anne Hulbert, Henry Wessels, Lauren Weinstein, Jerry Beck, Willard Spiegelman, Levi Tadar, Jesse Scheidlauer, and Robert Weil. You can support the Virtual Memories Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, a secret project that I feel like an abject failure about, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode during Toronto Comic Arts Festival, or TCAF. Uh, airfare was covered by my day job because I had a big networking dinner to, to host up in Toronto. Uh, but the hotel and meals were all on me, and this was the only episode I came away with. On the plus side, um, my wife and I got to have a really nice dinner on the last night of TCAF with Tom Spurgeon from the Comics Reporter and Jaime Hernandez of Love and Rockets. So, hey. If you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Noah Van Skyver, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Michael Hacker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Les Camella, Joe Caruso, Paul Karasik, Michael Janicek, and Stephen Solomon for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald. Use with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with the author and cartoonist Dave Calver, whose new book is Limbo Lounge. Till then, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube and tunein.com 
by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way.